Bonjour tout le monde et bienvenue à cette mise à jour sur la COVID-19 au Nouveau-Brunswick. Speaking at this afternoon's briefing will be the following individuals. Dr. Jennifer Russell, the Chief Medical Officer of Health, and the Honorable Dorothy Shepard, Minister of Health. Bonjour tout le monde et bienvenue à cette mise à jour sur le COVID-19 au Nouveau-Brunswick. Les personnes suivant prendront la parole lors de la séance d'information cet après-midi. Le Dr. Jennifer Russell, médecin hygiéniste en chef, et la ministre de la Santé, l'Honorable Dorothy Shepard. Dr. Russell. Good afternoon, everyone. Bonjour à toutes et à tous. For the last several months, I have been talking to you about all the ways that you can keep COVID-19 out of your life. Washing your hands, maintaining a physical distance of two meters or six feet, wearing a mask in public spaces indoors, and if you're in the orange phase, outdoors, and other guidance provided by public health. Today, I'm going to talk about how to make room in your life for COVID-19. As much as we all want to avoid catching this virus, we must be ready to face the reality of this pandemic so that we can manage it should it enter our lives. And right now we have three hot spots in the Maritimes right now, as you know, we have uh, zone, uh, the Moncton zone, the St. John zone, and also the Halifax zone. So I'm sure you've been hearing some uh, news reports out of Halifax around the community transmission there. It's very, very important that people take this very seriously because we don't know where the next hot spot is going to be in uh, our province. Today, there are hundreds of New Brunswickers in self-isolation doing their part to slow the spread of COVID-19 in New Brunswick. And I'm sure that very few people, very few of these people expected that this would happen to them. And even fewer made a plan for that eventuality. But everyone needs to be ready. So every New Brunswicker in every region of our province should have a plan for self-isolation before they are directed to self-isolate. Everyone needs to know where and how they will isolate themselves from their families, friends, and neighbors. Everyone needs to know how they would arrange their work, business, and other activities on short notice. Everyone needs to know who they can call for support and assistance during their 14 days of isolation, and certainly for mental health support and other types of supports, you can call 211, and also we would like you to look on our website for how to self-isolate properly, and um, if there's any other information that's pertinent to you, there are many, many resources on our website, uh, especially for mental health. Until a vaccine becomes widely available, the risk of local outbreaks of COVID-19 will remain high and we will continue to do everything we can when there are outbreaks to keep them as short as possible and keep them from affecting uh, as many people as possible. Isolating those who have or may have the virus is our most effective tool in slowing the spread of the disease and protecting our most vulnerable citizens. Uh, one of my friends on Facebook posted a, a really great visual on uh, how the virus in terms of the incubation period spread. So, for instance, we know the Republic exposures announced uh, for St. John. We have one today uh, in Fredericton. So when you calculate how many days before some people may become positive and may uh, test positive or have symptoms, well, a few days prior to that, they are, sim they are contagious. So even if you don't have symptoms prior to you becoming positive, you are contagious. And that's what the contact tracers determine in terms of who to, who to call as your close contacts. So making sure that you either keep your close contact number very low or keep track of the phone numbers and the names of the people that you're interacting with is very, very useful and very helpful for the contact tracers. Make a plan today. Don't just assume this will happen to someone else because it could very well happen to you and your family and you need to be ready. Aujourd'hui, il y a trois nouveaux cas confirmés de COVID-19 au Nouveau-Brunswick. Dans la zone 2, qui comprend les comtés de St. John, Kings et Charlotte, il y a deux nouveaux cas. Une personne âgée 50 à 59 ans, une personne âgée 70 et 79 ans. Toutes ces personnes sont en isolement et leur cas fait l'objet d'une enquête. Il y a un nouveau cas lié à un voyage dans la zone 6, soit la région de Bathurst et la de la péninsule acadienne. Une personne âgée de 30 à 39 ans. 
Il y a présentement 94 cas actifs dans la province et une personne ayant contracté le virus est présentement hospitalisée. Veuillez accompagner ces citoyens du Nouveau-Brunswick dans vos pensées et vos prières aujourd'hui. Today, there are three new cases of COVID-19 in New Brunswick. In Zone 2, which is St. John, Kings, and Charlotte counties, there are two new cases. One individual aged 50 to 59, one individual aged 70 to 79. These cases are self-isolating and are under investigation. And people do like to know uh, if that people are self-isolating when they have tested positive. In Zone 6, which is Bathurst and the Acadian Peninsula, there is one new case which is travel related. One individual aged 30 to 39. We have 94 active cases in the province with one individual now in hospital. I do want to thank everyone who is self-isolating for the sacrifices that they are making. And when it comes to self-isolating, and again, the, the, the period that people are contagious before they uh, develop symptoms, if you are a close contact of somebody and you were already self-isolating when you develop symptoms and you got tested, we're obviously not as worried about the transmission chain of somebody uh, associated with that type of uh, a case of COVID-19. We are very concerned about those people who might have been exposed in a public exposure setting who may be contagious prior to developing symptoms and getting tested. So those are the people we're most worried about right now, and there are many of them who are, fall into the age group of about um, 19 to 30. As I said yesterday, we have record numbers of people now self-isolating across the province, and I think it's upwards of 1,000. Their cooperation is crucial in slowing the further spread of COVID-19 virus. And again, I direct you to the website if you are self-isolating to get very specific information on how to do that safely. And I know that the contact tracing um, folks, uh, the nurses from public health, are doing an excellent job of making sure that people understand and are aware of those details. While the vast majority are cooperative when directed to self-isolate, I know that it can be frustrating and that's why I'm trying to help the entire population be very, very ready for the very real uh, necessity of having to self-isolate. So most of these concerns arise again if you haven't been prepared. So that's why I'm having, uh, why I'm, pre I'm providing these messages today around pre preparation. Beaucoup se retrouvent devant un garde-manger vide et ne savent pas trop comment s'approvisionner. D'autres ont des emplois, des entreprises ou des activités qu'ils ne peuvent pas facilement mettre en attente. Peut-être que quelqu'un compte sur vous pour de l'aide. Une personne avec laquelle le personnel de la santé publique a communiqué s'inquiétait du, du fait qu'elle ne pourrait pas aller nourrir son cheval et qu'elle n'avait pas trouvé personne pour le faire à sa place. These worries can be alleviated if we all plan ahead. There are tips and suggestions on the GNB website, but there are a few ideas to get you started. As the province navigates the second wave of COVID-19, people who need support are often unsure where to turn, whether it's help obtaining food, mental health support, and other non-emergency programs and services in the community. Residents are advised to dial 211. This is a free, bilingual, confidential resource to help New Brunswickers navigate the network of community, social, non-clinical health and government services. Alors que la province affronte la deuxième vague de COVID-19, les gens qui ont besoin de soutien ne savent pas toujours vers, se tourner, vers qui se tourner. Que ce soit pour obtenir de la nourriture, des services de soutien en matière de santé mentale ou d'autres programmes et services non urgents dans la communauté, les résidents peuvent composer le 211. Il s'agit d'une ressource gratuite, bilingue et confidentielle ayant pour but d'aider les gens du Nouveau-Brunswick à s'orienter dans les réseaux de services communautaires et sociaux, des services de santé non cliniques et des services gouvernementaires. Déterminez à l'avance ce dont vous aurez besoin pour les deux semaines d'isolement. Quelle pièce de la maison utiliserez-vous? Il est préférable d'utiliser une salle de bain séparée si vous vous isolez. Si vous n'avez pas une deuxième salle de bain, que ferez-vous? Discutez avec votre patron et vos collègues de, de, des dispositions à prendre pour travailler de la maison dans la mesure possible et des répercussions de votre isolement sur votre lieu de travail. Set up a buddy system with friends and neighbors so that they can, that, so you can call on one another for help with groceries and errands should the need arise. Being ready for self-isolation means having to rely on others. And I know sometimes that is hard to do, but the context of a global can pandemic, we need to be able to look after other people just as we look after ourselves. The pandemic has taught us some hard lessons, but it also has shown us boundless capacity for strength, courage, compassion, and empathy.
If we stay together and work together for each other, we will get through this. La pandémie nous a appris de dures leçons, mais elle nous a également montré que nous avions une capacité illimitée en ce qui concerne la force, le courage, la compassion et l'empathie. Si nous restons unis et travaillons ensemble, les uns pour les autres, nous réussirons à traverser cette épreuve. Lastly, I just want to reiterate that the hot zones right now are Halifax. We are discouraging all non-essential travel because it is a very, very difficult situation there with community transmission being very, very serious. So we really don't want people traveling for non-essential reasons to Halifax. We do not want people traveling in and out of the Orange Zones and the Moncton Zone and the St. John Zone for non-essential reasons either. And again, we do have public exposure settings. So the next 14 days, we will be watching for more cases as a result of close contacts and of public exposures. And we also, again, want to protect our vulnerable populations because as soon as a case gets into a facility uh, with vulnerable population, with vulnerable people, it is very, very challenging and obviously hard on uh, the staff and the mental health of the people uh, who are involved and the family members of those involved. So again, I trust that you will do everything in your power to protect you and your loved ones. If you have made plans to travel or gather, I hope that you cancel them. And if you were planning to, I hope that you were not planning to travel or gather. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, bonjour. As active cases of COVID-19 continue to rise in our province and across the country, it is understandable that stress and anxiety are also increasing. On top of this, people who are currently waiting to be tested for COVID-19 are frustrated. We are seeing an increase in the demand for testing as of late, and we are working hard to address it. Yesterday alone, more than 1,384 requests for a COVID test were submitted online, including 503 requests alone in Zone 2, the St. John region, and 333 in Zone 3, the Fredericton region. Priority groups are being tested first. Public Health is working with all of its partners, including the regional health authorities, to address additional volumes by increasing hours and capacity at the St. John Rope Walk Assessment Center behind the St. John Regional YMCA, as well as setting up another assessment center on Rossay Road. Horizon Health Network is also working on increasing capacity in Fredericton with an additional setup at the current location at the Capitol Exhibition Center and an additional location later this week. In the last 24 hour cycle, more than 1,060 tests were processed. Everyone can help ensure you submit your correct phone number, keeping your phone close by, and please answer it when an assessment site calls to schedule your appointment. As more information about testing becomes available, we will share it with you. COVID-19 fatigue is real. It isn't a diagnosis, but rather a description for a range of symptoms and frustrations with the prolonged pandemic response. The longer this pandemic goes on, the bigger the impact COVID-19 fatigue has on our mental health. It is important to know that you are not alone in feeling the way you do. In fact, all of us will likely experience increased feelings of social isolation and loneliness. While this is true at any time of the year, I think those feelings will be even stronger during our holiday season. Traditionally, this is a time we connect with family and friends, and while we still need to do that, we must do it differently this year. While the holidays can bring out the best in people, they're also a time where feelings of social isolation and loneliness can feel even more acute. And many of the people at the high, highest risk from COVID-19, the people who should be most vigilant about social distancing, are also the most at risk for feelings of increased 
social isolation, and loneliness. I urge all New Brunswickers to take care of your emotional health today and in the days to come. Pay attention to how you are feeling and take the necessary steps to manage the stressors in your life. Exercise regularly, eat healthy meals, get plenty of sleep, and avoid alcohol and other drugs. Maintain a regular routine and make time to unwind and manage your emotions. Develop a plan to remain connected with others without exposing each other to COVID-19. Where possible, use technology to stay connected with friends and family and share your concerns with others. Sometimes, simply talking about what is bothering you can help alleviate the stress and anxiety associated with it. Give yourself a COVID-19 break. While it is important to stay informed, it is easy to get overwhelmed with all of the information out there. Look ahead at your calendar and identify social connections that might be disrupted during the outbreak and consider alternative solutions to stay connected. Create a list of community organizations that can provide support and resources if needed. And as Dr. Russell said, 211 can be a close resource for you. If you are struggling to cope, please reach out for help. Doing so is not a sign of weakness. It is a sign of strength. Resources are available, including Kids Help Phone, Chemo Helpline, and Hope for Wellness Helpline. If you have a pre-existing mental health condition and are experiencing new symptoms, or you feel you are unable to cope with your normal responsibilities, please contact your health care provider or a local addictions and mental health centre. More information on these and other resources can be found on the coronavirus page of the Government of New Brunswick website. And if someone reaches out to you, please listen and help where you can. We are truly all in this together. And that is how we will get through this challenging time, through kindness, empathy, and support for one another. Right now, things are especially hard as we experience the second wave of the pandemic. What is happening now is, is the result of actions taken in the past week or two. We can't change that, but we can make a difference in going forward. If we all follow public health measures and take the steps needed to keep one another healthy and safe, we will see better results in the next week or two. Working together, we have the power to make a positive difference. Thank you. Merci. Mr. Shepherd, Dr. Russell. We'll now proceed with questions from the members of the media. Each reporter will have one question. You have the right to pose your question in the language of your choice. And please ensure your microphones are muted. Nous allons maintenant procéder aux questions des journalistes. Vous avez le droit de poser vos questions dans la langue de votre choix. Chaque journaliste peut poser une question. Et s'il vous plaît, voulez vous rassurer de désactiver le son de vos micros. Timothy Jakes, Campbellton Tribune. Uh, yes, my question is for uh, Dr. Russell. Uh, on Saturday's press conference, uh, with respect to the last outbreak in Zone 5, uh, you said your team was able to track down the links for all the cases except the index case. Uh, who you said had died uh, before you could do an interview and get more information. Uh, could you elaborate on this index case or patient zero? And uh, did this person die of COVID or how do you know there were patient zero? Uh, were you ever able to determine or can you at least offer an opinion where the person caught COVID within zone five or elsewhere? All I can say is that they were positive for COVID-19 and we were not able to interview the person uh, again because they were severely uh, ill. Thank you, Mr. J. Tim, <laughs> thank you, Tim. <laughs> Long day, guys. Matthew Guacomo, Lacadie Nouvelle. 
Bonjour, ma question est pour euh, Dr. Russell. Je sais qu'il est très tôt dans la phase euh, orange pour Moncton et Saint-Jean, mais j'aimerais que vous nous dites si, depuis euh, qu'on est passé en phase orange dans ces deux régions-là, si on s'en va dans la bonne direction pour un retour à la phase jaune ou s'il si y a encore euh, d'importantes améliorations à faire. C'est vraiment trop tôt à dire, mais c'est quelque chose que je discute chaque jour avec euh, les médecins hygiénistes et aussi les épidémiologistes. Alors, c'est quelque chose qui, qui, qui vraiment, ça va, ça va dérouler euh, dans, les, dans les prochains jours euh, quand on voit encore les, les résultats des tests. Alors, c'est trop tôt à dire à ce moment-ci. Merci, docteur. Merci, M. Wacomo. Laura Brown, CTV News. Hi there. I'm wondering how many tests on average every day in New Brunswick, basically what is our capacity test? And then what is the backlog at currently? How many tests are, being, are waiting in the way to be processed? So my understanding is that our capacity is between 2,000 and 3,000 a day. Uh, the backlog, um, it's the, the ones that are prioritized to be done within 24 hours are being done. So those would be the ones if they're uh, pre-op testing, if they're ones that are ordered by public health or for people who are close contacts, et cetera, or people that are self-isolating, et cetera. Uh, so all of those priority ones are being done within 24 hours. Uh, my understanding is with the increased uh, hours and the extra assessment center in St. John, as well as extra capacity uh, in, uh, zone, in, in the Fredericton zone, that we're, we are catching up. Um, will we be caught up in the next 24 to 48 hours? That is my understanding. But we're not behind with respect to the priority uh, tests. Thank you, Ms. Brown. Thank you, Dr. Vicki Hogarth, Charlotte County TV. Thank you, Bruce. My question is either for Dr. Russell or Minister Shepherd. I spoke to some healthcare providers today who would like to be able to directly refer patients to testing sites. Why funnel all the testing requests through 811? Why not allow doctors to refer patients directly to the most appropriate testing site and alleviate the overload on 811? Uh, they can use the online assessment form for sure. That's definitely an option, um, and that's they don't so they don't have to go through any other extra steps. Thank you, Ms. Hogarth. Thank you, Doctor Natalie Sturgeon, Telegraph Journal. Um, I think first, my question is for either Dr. Russell or, or Minister Shepherd. Um, we've been speaking today to some parents who. Um, specifically are speaking to significant delays between the time that they requested a test online um, and when they got an appointment. So uh, this, this particular case spoke about a 56-hour delay. Um, we know there's a backlog and, and a, a, a second testing center being set up in Zone 2, um, but some people feel that there needs to be more communication with the public about delay, delays in appointments for testing and, and testing and that it creates additional anxiety. Um, for people awaiting those appointments, what commitments can public health make about getting that information um, when significant delays are expected to make appointments or, or testing? So I will acknowledge that there are delays, again, with the, one, with the tests that are not prioritized, uh, but the ones that are prioritized are being done within 24 hours. And in terms of communication, um, I think, again, we're acknowledging that there are delays, but I can understand that it would be frustrating and, and cause more anxiety. Just, just to add to Dr. Russell's comments on that, we, we recognize that we had a technical glitch um, early in the week with regards to um, um, with regards to requests for testing getting through to uh, to the schedulers. That has been resolved. There was a second issue that has been resolved. And so um, again, as Dr. Russell explained, we have a um, we have a backlog. That backlog, um, all of the priorities have been addressed. And as we go through the next day or so, you're going to find that with the additional testing capacity that we have, we're going to be able to clean those up. Thank you, Minister. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you, Ms. Sturgeon. Marie-Ève Arsenault, Radio-Canada. Oui, bonjour. Ma question est pour la Dr. Russell. Elle confirme aussi la formation de la veille sur la séance de transmission communautaire à Canton. Donc, combien de temps exactement ça vous a pris pour relier tous les cas à Canton? Puis, quel échéancier vous donnez-vous pour faire une conclusion à Moncton à savoir s'il y en a ou pas de, de transmission communautaire? 
Alors, à ce moment-ci, il y a des cas qui sont encore euh, sous enquête et euh, avec l'éclosion à, à zone 5 à Camelton et Dalhousie, euh, il y avait, ça a pris presque quatre semaines avant qu'on a trouvé tous les liens. Alors, je ne peux pas vous dire combien longtemps que ça va prendre, mais je sais qu'il y a encore des cas qui sont sous enquête. Euh, euh, je ne peux pas vous dire quand que ça va être euh, euh, déterminé, quel, tous les liens. Merci. Donc, on donne... Merci. Travis Fortnum, Global TV. Hi there. My question is also about testing. Uh, with the second testing center going up in Zone 2, obviously that's going to help us move through uh, this backlog or clear up some of the delays we're seeing in testing. But how will getting more people in Zone 2 tested actually help flatten the curve that we're seeing in the second phase? Well, the combination of contact tracing and testing and self-isolation are the three big pillars uh, that we need to succeed at flattening the curve at this moment. We also need the public to cooperate with keeping their close contact numbers low, not attending gatherings, uh, stay, for, the, for the orange zones for, in particular, staying in your one household bubble. These are sacrifices that we want people to make. Um, and, and again, I know when people uh, aren't aware that, that, there are, that their community is at risk of, of ha becoming a hotspot, we really have to be proactive and preemptive no matter where you are in the province at all times that your community could be the next hotspot. So everybody needs to take precautions all around the province at all times. Again, we have two hotspots in our province right now in the Moncton zone and the St. John zone, but Halifax is a short drive from here and it is a very big hot spot right now in terms of community transmission. So I am very concerned about the risks right now. That is why we're recommending no non-essential travel to Halifax and no non-essential travel into or out of the orange zones here in New Brunswick. Thank you, Doctor. Doctor, Mr. Fortnum. John Chilebeck, Daily Gleaner. I appreciate that the fluid situation in Fredericton, which remains, remains yellow, but I was hoping Dr. Russell could um, alleviate some of the confusion around the outbreak that was declared at the Stan Cassidy Center, because it was one case and then uh, at the schools that are in Region 3, such as Montgomery and um, Centerville Community School, there was one kg each and they were not declared outbreaks so just if you could explain uh, the difference between uh, those three cases and why some places are declared an outbreak and others are not so for um, facilities that have vulnerable populations in them like the stan cassidy like a long-term care facility like an arf nursing home etc those are because they're such vulnerable populations and uh, the risks are so, so high. Uh, that is the reason that the outbreaks are declared because in those situations, they actually, the protocols that are in place with Horizon Vitalité as well as social development are such that all the staff and all the patients need to be tested right away and will be tested every several days and have to be isolated, etc. So the protocols are very rigid and very strict around those facilities because of the vulnerable populations in those settings. For schools, um, it's different because it really has to do with what the risk assessment is with the uh, uh, medical officer of health. And I'm really glad you asked this question because as a parent, I do understand that there would always be anxiety as soon as you hear of a case that's affiliated or associated with a school. Um, as soon as you hear that somebody from a school, such as Montgomery Street School, whether it's a staff or a student, has tested positive, uh, it would set off alarm bells in your mind in terms of what is happening at that school, what has happened at that school. But sometimes the exposure did not take place at the school setting this, and the person who tested positive may not have actually been at the school during the time that they were contagious. And that would be reflected in the contact tracing that would be done and that would be reflected in whatever measures the school needs to take to protect the bubbles and protect the students and protect the other staff. So I think what parents need to really understand is that the risk assessments when somebody tests positive in a school setting that the exposure for the staff and the students may not actually be there. So it's a public notification or a, sorry, a, a school community notification because we don't normally um, communicate that with the public unless there's a concern. Um, and, and again, if there is close contact with other staff or with students or classes, et cetera, 
then that information is communicated directly to the parents of the children involved or directly to the staff who are involved with respect to self-isolation and their risks. So, so it is a different type of setting because we would never swab the entire school, we would never swab all of the staff in that particular case because we are, because of the plan that we have with EECD around outbreak management and all the protocols that were set up, there are very, very detailed um, ways of managing these situations and again, all based on the risk assessments that the medical officer does as well as the protocols that we have to, to which will dictate what steps the school will take. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you, Mr. Chilobek. Tom Bateman. Hi there. Uh, I think we can go to the Minister or Dr. Russell. Uh, Dr. Russell, you spoke uh, this week about how important it is to engage younger New Brunswickers who have seen higher rates of infection in recent in these recent outbreaks in New Brunswick. Uh, that made me think of the COVID alert app. Uh, and then you wonder, you know, whether it's working at all uh, during these outbreaks. Do you know how many times the app has been used uh, by a COVID positive person in this province to alert others? I know other provinces have distributed that data. Uh, you know, or are you even aware anecdotally of, of the app working at all? Thank you. Great question, Tom. We're not able to get data from the federal government, is my understanding, on how many people in each province have the app. We are just given a total for Canada. Um, obviously, the more people who have it, the better, um, because it would um, increase the, the, the time frame, or decrease the time frame, rather, between uh, notifying somebody as being positive and, and making sure that they do all the, take all the steps to protect themselves and, and others. Um, and, but one time, we are getting data on one-time um, key entries, so that should be coming. I don't have it right now, but that's my understanding. Yeah, that's what I'm asking about is, is, yeah, how many times it's been used. So it is being used in the province. That's my understanding. Cases. Yes, Mr. Bateman. Nicholas Steinbeck, Radio Canada. Uh, oui, bonjour, merci Bruce. Uh, la question est pour uh, Dr. Russell. Doctor, um, je voudrais savoir avec l'augmentation des cas en Nouvelle-Écosse qui augmente jour après jour avec l'éclosion à Halifax, est-ce que, qu'est-ce que ça prendrait finalement pour euh, demander, euh, recommander que le Nouveau-Brunswick ferme sa frontière euh, avec la Nouvelle-Écosse euh, et donc se referme de la bulle atlantique. Euh, Qu'est-ce que ça prendrait de plus pour que ça pour ferme la frontière avec la Nouvelle-Écosse? Alors, les discussions que j'ai déjà eues avec euh, le médecin hygiéniste en chef euh, du Nouvelle-Écosse, euh, Dr. Strang, et aussi mes collègues ici, euh, ont... On voit que le risque augmente toujours et c'est très important que les gens du Nouveau-Brunswick sachent qu'il y a des problèmes à, à, à Halifax maintenant au niveau de, de la transmission communautaire. Alors c'est pour ça que maintenant, euh, dès que samedi soir, je crois qu'on a, on a, on a um, donné un avis à les gens de ne pas voyager à Halifax uh, pour des raisons non essentielles. Uh, mais C'est des discussions aussi qu'il faut avoir avec le gouvernement et le cabinet COVID-19 pour euh, faire des décisions euh, euh, avec les informations euh, parce que ça change chaque jour. Merci, M. Steinbeck. Merci, Dr. Savannah Odd, Telegraph Journal. Hi there. Uh, my question is for Dr. Russell. You said uh, economic security plays a role in individual health. Um, so at what at what point would you recommend uh, government consider reintroducing emergency support for financially vulnerable folks, uh, for example, who might be missing shifts, waiting for a test? And similarly, at what point would you recommend a pause on evictions? We know there's a link there between stable housing and mental health. My understanding is social development would probably be a better place to have those questions answered. There are some resiliency teams in place and I know that social development does have a plan on housing. With respect to mental health and addictions, I could let the minister speak on that. So the, it's a very valid question because we don't know what this near future is going to bring and I think we have to be aware that um, encompassing all of these um, th these social de you know social determinants of health, whether it be mental health, addictions, and um, and housing and income, are all going to be very top of mind for many New Brunswickers faced with 
um, the perhaps the temporary closure of their business. At this time, it's not something that's been put on the table, but I, I do think that there will be discussions going forward, I'm sure brought up by many individuals, um, that we have to be cognizant that there's going to be some real stressors out there, and uh, we're going to have to put in another, um, you know, put in a plan to, uh, to try to deal with it. So we don't have a de definitive answer for you today on that, but I want you to know that it's very much top of mind. Thank you, Ms. Odd. Marie Sutherland, CBC. Good afternoon. My question is for uh, Dorothy Shepard, um, although I suppose it could be for Russell as well. I'm wondering, can you tell me, have there been any cases of healthcare workers being asked to report to work, even if they're aware they've been exposed to a COVID-19 case? And what's your policy around this? Are there um, allowances for, for when staffing is tight? I have not been aware of anyone asking to report to work, even if they're symptomatic. In fact, we encourage the, quite the opposite. Um, and in fact, we have, um, you know, we, we have been dealing with work, short, work staff shortages um, in all regions because of COVID-19 and, and potential exposures. So there are strategic plans in place. The RHAs know that we have to have um, those strategic plans in place, and we're still operating uh, as of today. Uh, pretty much at um, you know at our, our at the levels we need to operate at, and we certainly keep to keep on top of that at every single morning briefing. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Sutherland. Hadil Ibrahim, CBC. Thank you. This question is for Minister Shepherd. Did we get an update on the Shannon's Parkland outbreak? Last we heard, it was three residents and one employee who tested positive on Sunday. Has anyone been tested and are you expecting more cases? Has, sorry, has everyone been tested? Just because Dr. Russell has those numbers from today's briefing, I'm going to let her take that. Um, my understanding is there was only one other case that was that turned out positive in the Shanex, but they are going to continue to test every several days, uh, the, the staff as well as the um, residents. Thank you, Ms. Ibrahim. Erica I'm sorry, Butler, in this case, is that the new one that we haven't heard about before? Just checking. So yes, I believe that was one new one this morning, and we do have more. We've just done another round of um, of testing, so we'll know by tomorrow morning how they all turn out. Thank you, Erica Butler, CHMA Sackville. Hi there. Um, this is for Minister Shepard. Um, COVID-19 has worsened the rate of opioid overdoses and we're now heading into winter, so more time will be spent alone. Is there a plan to address the opioid crisis this winter and will there be a ramp up of resources for addiction services in general? Addictions and mental health, as most people know, has been very top of mind for me and very uh, very much something I've been pursuing with the department. And so the answer, the short answer is yes. Um, do we have um, all of that to identify for you today? I do not. But we are um, constantly working with mental health and addictions to promote um, the initiatives that we've done. We've done some in-community initiatives already, and we are working on more. Um, homelessness. Um, addictions they are you know they are, are are circumstances that need immediate attention and so we are we're certainly compiling those prom programs in community with various communities to try to address it as broad as we can thank you minister thank you miss Butler That concludes today's update. Cela conclut la séance d'aujourd'hui. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much.